there's a letter in the Igris Kodesh where the Rebbe writes to somebody who asked, why are there not so many Meshalim in Chassidus Chabad? Why in the Maimodim of the Rebbeim, the Hasidic discourses of the Rebbeim of Chabad, why are there not so many metaphors or analogies? Which is an interesting question because I think there are a lot of mashalim, there are a lot of metaphors. But from the Rebbe's answer, it's apparent what the person meant was a certain type of metaphor which you don't really find in, in Chabad teachings. And, and that is an extended metaphor, like a story that has characters and dialogue and chapters. When there's a metaphor in Chassidus Chabad, it's like a short little one-liner. It'll be like, the relative non-existence of the creation as compared to the absolute existence of the creator is like the relative non-existence of the sun ray when it is still contained within the sun. You know, that's like a, a marshal from Chabad. It's a one-liner. It's just a, a little visualization that'll help you to understand the concept. As opposed to other styles of chassidus, where you have a whole long story, and this guy said to that guy, and then they went on a trip, and then a bunch of different stuff happened, like a whole, like a whole book, like a whole novel. So you don't have that stuff. The truth is, I think the longest metaphor in Chabad is probably Melech Basada, the king in the field. And that's not even long. It's like three sentences. There was a king. He left the palace. He returned to the palace. On the way back to the palace, the people in the field came up to him, and he smiled at them all. And then they followed him back to the palace. And that's like the longest parable. So this guy asks why you don't find it so much. And it's interesting what the Rebbe answers. The Rebbe says that the way that people use metaphors or parables normally, in normal communication, is as a rhetorical device. In other words, it's a tool that you use to explain something. Specifically, when do you use a mushal, a parable, or a metaphor, when the concept you're speaking about is a lofty concept, and therefore to speak about it more is only going to further alienate your audience. So what do you do? You back away from the concept you're really talking about, and you speak about something that you're not really talking about, but it's more relatable. And then when the person relates to the relatable idea, you build a bridge of similarities from the relatable concept to the previously unrelatable concept, and now you've given people the ability to understand something that they couldn't have understood on their own because they see the commonalities or the similarities with the thing that they already relate to. And that's how you use a metaphor effectively. The Rebbe says that is not how metaphors are used in the teachings of the Rebbe M. of Chabad. Rather, the reason why you don't find as many metaphors and you don't find extended lengthy metaphors is because when the Rabbeim of Chabad use a metaphor, they're not using it the way that normally metaphors are used. They're not comparing one thing to another thing. That's a normal metaphor. You compare one thing to another thing. Or more specifically, you compare a familiar thing to an unfamiliar thing to help to familiarize you with the previously unfamiliar thing. But it's the comparison of two things. The Rebbe says, in Chabad Chassidus, the Rebbeim do not compare one thing to another thing. Rather, when they use a marshal, a metaphor, they are describing one thing as that one thing simultaneously coexists on multiple planes of reality. So, for instance, if we say that Zoh and Malchus, 
These are spiritual energies in Atsilas, the highest world. If we say that Zo and Malchus, the six emotional building block energies and the receptive energy which accepts those energies in order to give birth to further worlds, when we say that they are comparable to the six workdays and Shabbos, and that in turn, the six days of work and Shabbos are comparable to a husband and a wife. We're not saying that they bear a similarity to one another. We're saying there's one thing. In Atsilis, it's called Zon Malchus. In time, it's called the six workdays and Shabbos. In your home, it's called the mother and the father, a husband and a wife. So these are not comparisons. These are understanding one thing on multiple planes. So when we talk about gender or anything that exists in our experience of this world, the reason it is the way it is down here is because of the way it is up there. And therefore, you can go both directions. You can learn from above to below and from below to above. They call it Havshota and Halbasha. Havshota is to strip away the physical trappings of an entity until you're left with the spiritual core. That would be like you study something that takes place in the human realm, in human experience, and by studying it, you gain insight into spiritual phenomena. But you could do it the opposite way as well. You could do halbasha. You can learn about a level in Seder Ishtauslis, in the spiritual worlds, and by learning about that, it can give you insight into how that manifests, manifests itself when it devolves into the physical realm. That's halbasha, where you're malbush. You invest the spiritual concept into a physical context. So we can go both directions. And the more comfortable we come, we become with these, with these ideas, the more we could sort of fluidly go in and out of halbasha, hafshata, until basically we understand the mashal, the nimshal, it's all one thing. So when we speak about masculinity and femininity as spiritual energies, we're speaking about masculinity and femininity as gender roles within a society, as well as within biology, as well as within psychology, and everything in between. But we have to begin with the premise that the reason things are the way they are is because that's how they are up there. And as above, so below. So, uh, what's more godly, God's infinity or his finitude? I like that. You said... Say it again. There are countable infinities and uncountable infinities, and both were created by God. Or maybe even on a deeper level, both are an expression of God himself. God can create a rock that he cannot lift. Yes. So what's holier? The heavens or the earth? When Mashiach comes, all the bodies, all the souls that 
left their bodies in the, in the ground and went to heaven and have been having aliyah after aliyah, they're all going to make a U-turn and come back to their bodies here in the physical world. Why? Why should they change their direction after so many elevations? They're not changing the direction. When the physical world will become refined, when Mashiach comes, the only way to go higher for these souls will be to come back to embodiment, because that's how pure and refined the physical world will be. The physical world will be holier than heaven. So we tend to think of the spiritual as more godly and the physical as less godly. But really, it's not true. When Mashiach comes, all flesh will see that the mouth of God is speaking, which means that Hashem is speaking everything into being and will look at the physical world and will see godliness. So you know this notion that the spiritual is somehow more godly than the physical, it actually comes from the male domination of society and religious thought for the past 5,783 years. It's an artifact of patriarchy. Of course men recognize Hashem's masculinity and exalt and revere it and fail to recognize and even denigrate Hashem's femininity. So of course we think of the heavens as loftier than the earth or the soul as more important than the body. But the reality is that God, one God, created both. And there's a symbiotic relationship between them. The infant, the finite, the spiritual, the physical, the soul, the body. It's all oneness, just two different manifestations of the one. For, for, for 5,783 years, we've been ruled by a primarily masculine biased view of reality and of God. And when Mashiach comes, we will usher in a new era of divine femininity. There will be Elias HaMalchus, Malchus, which is Hashem's feminine attribute, will rise into prominence. And then one of the symptoms of that is that we will see the infinity of the body, and the body will live forever. We will see that it's not that the body needs a soul, but the soul needs a body. The soul will actually be nurtured from the body instead of the body from the soul. And Eishas Chayel Ateres Baila, the woman of valor, the virtuous wife, will become a crown. She will rise to prominence above her husband. Hashem's femininity will take on greater prominence and recognition. And we'll see the value of the physical world. And we'll realize that here's where it's at. And that's why all the souls in heaven, which is a masculine experience, are going to come rushing back to the physical earth, which is a feminine experience. And that which we thought of as higher is really lower, and that which we thought of as lower is really higher. And it's happening right now, and we're living in a crazy time of flux and transition where an old paradigm is closing and a new paradigm is opening. For millennia, the masculine view of God and of reality has been prevalent, and that's why the Avdi Veda Zoda have dominated the world, because idolatry is primarily a function of masculine spirituality. When Mashiach comes, feminine spirituality will dominate. And then the Jewish people will rise to their proper place of prominence as guides and teachers to the entire world. The Alter Rebbe says something cool in Lukut Torah. 
on uh, my bar mitzvah parsha, parsha shlach, it says that the spies were all men, kulam anoshim, which is a little bit, it's a funny statement to make. Rashi even deals with it because it's so in your face. And he has his way of explaining it. But uh, the al Tareb explains it like this. What was the problem with the spies? Remember the spies that Moshe Rabbeinu sent into the land to prepare the nation for entering the promised land? The problem they had was they came back and they said that it's a land that devours its inhabitants. And as Chassidus explains, that meant that they were afraid that the land, literally being engaged in everyday mundane physical activities like city building and agriculture, all the stuff they didn't have to do in the wilderness because they were sustained by bread from heaven and a well of Miriam and they had clouds of glory. So they were afraid that that earthliness would devour them, it would consume them. That if they would enter the land and have to deal with everyday mundane activities, they would lose their connection to God. So the spies came back and they said, let's not enter the land, let's stay in Koilal all of our lives. It's beautiful here. Everything's taken care of. We don't have to worry about anything mundane. And we'll connect to God through the Torah we were given, even though we can't do all of the mitzvahs, no problem. We'll just learn them as spiritual concepts. They had the Torah already, so they could just learn it spiritually as ideas. So we won't apply it in the literal, physical way. Okay? No, no. So the Alta Rebbe says, that's why it says, Kulam Anoshim. They were all men. Because it means they were such men. If they would have been women, they would have appreciated what the land can do for them. They would have appreciated that the real Yiddishkeit is only in the land. It's not in the spiritual archetypes, it's in the everyday living. The, uh, the models of loving the land were B'nai uh, They loved the land, it says. What does that mean, they loved the land? They wanted to have property, they wanted real estate. Real estate developers. They loved the land means they understood that the ultimate purpose is in the land. That's a uniquely feminine perspective. The masculine perspective is the higher it is, the more abstract it is, the loftier it is, the cooler it is. And the feminine perspective is that's nice, but what does it look like in real life? Let's apply it. And that's Zo and Malchus in Atzilus. In the highest world, Atzilus means the world of emanation. It's such a transparent world that it's almost more creator than creation. That's why it's called the world of emanation. Up there, you have Zo and Malchus. Zo, Zer Anpin, is the six emotional energies. Chesed, Gvoret, Feres, Netzachayid, Yusayid which are the six building blocks for creation. The six energies which creation, all creation is made of. And they correspond to the six days of creation. First day is chesed, second day is kvoda, third day is tifera, so on and so forth. But on their own they do not create because they are comfortable existing in abstraction. It's only because of Malchus, the feminine aspect of divinity in Atzilos, 
which draws them down, Malchus is Ein Melech Blei Um. You can't have a king without a kingdom. Meaning Zoh is like the professor in his ivory tower. He doesn't need to talk to anyone. He doesn't want to talk to anyone. He's totally self-sufficient. And you can't draw him out of himself. Malchus is like a melech. Who's a melech? A melech is only one who has a kingdom. You can't be a melech and not have a kingdom. Meaning the identity of Malchus is a relationship. Sounds feminine, right? The identity of Malchus is the relationship. So Malchus draws Zod down into a union where they unite and he deposits his creative energies within her. See, Malchus is receptive. She wants to create, but she can't create on her own. She wants to have a relationship with something outside of herself, but she can't create anything outside of herself on her own. She needs his creative energy. So Malchus attracts Zah. Zah then unites with her and deposits his creative energies, the six emotional energies, into her. She receives it. She becomes impregnated. And then Malchus of Atzilus gives birth to Bria. And then the same thing happens again. Malchus of Bria attracts Za of Bria, she becomes impregnated with his creative energies and she gives birth to Yitzira. And it happens again in Yitzira and then she gives birth to Asiya. And this is all an interaction that's happening within Hashem himself. I'm using the terms of the spheroids, Za and Malchus, but there are Shemais, there are divine names that correspond to these concepts as well. In Shemois, in divine names, it's called Kutchebrichu. Za is called Kutchebrichu. And Malchus is called Shchinte. Kutchebrichu, what does Kutchebrichu mean? The word Kodesh we translate as holy, but holy is not a good translation. Really, it means set apart. What, what's holy? Holy is something that's set apart. You don't use it for ordinary use because it's set apart. Marriage is called Kiddushin, for instance, because it establishes an exclusive relationship where you set apart this relationship as unique from all others. A Sefer Torah is holy because you don't use it for ordinary things. So Kodesh means set apart. But it could even be aloof, detached. So Hashem's masculine energy, Kud Shabrichu, is Kodush Umuvdo. It's aloof and set apart from creation. It's more interested in spirituality, in loftiness. Malchus is Shchinte, the Shchina. What's Shchina? Shchina is Shoychenes. It means it dwells within, it gets down. Zah is flying up. Malchus is settling down. In fact, not only the Shechina settles down, is Shoichenes, and dwells within, but she goes so far that what does Torah tell us? That even when B'nai Yisrael are in a state of Tumah, B'tumasam, when they're in a state of impurity, the Shechina is with them. Because that's what the Shechina is. The Shechina is the mother who will change dirty diapers. She'll go down as far as she needs to go down. Where her children are, she'll go to them. She's not afraid of going down. So you see, masculinity and femininity in their source are like diametrically pointed energies. One wants to go up, 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 up and away, and the other one wants to settle down. One of the reasons that a kain gadol on Yom Kippur has to be married is because we learned what happens when unattached men enter the Holy of Holies. The two sons of Aaron, Nadav and Avihu, 
There are different explanations of why they died when they entered the Holy of Holies. But the common denominator between the different explanations is they saw the spiritual revel revelation and their souls took flight. They just ran away with it. They didn't want to come back to their bodies. They didn't want to come back to this boring world. So one explanation is that they weren't married. Well, that's the same thing. For a man not to be married means he's not interested in the mundanity and the everyday and the ordinariness of this physical world. Maybe even he's afraid of it. Another interpretation, by the way, is that they were drunk. But that's the same thing again. It's also escapism. Not wanting to be present in the here and now. Same idea. Another explanation is that they were mechusar bagadim. They didn't have their coin uniforms on, their clothes. And if anyone ever learned Tanya, you know what clothing is in Tanya, right? What's clothing in Tanya? So behaviors, expression, meaning how you act down here, as opposed to the soul, which is the internal. The clothing means the behaviors, how you engage with the world. So they weren't interested in that. So, sort of like the Maraglim. Meraglim just wanted to be holy. They didn't want to get involved in anything uh, every day. So a Koen Gadol has to be married because if he's going to enter the holiest place on earth on the holiest day of the year and he doesn't have a Malchus for his Zah, a Shechina for his Kutshebrichu, he's just going to fly away and never come back. Now the misogynistic way of mocking that is with the terrible expression people use, the ball and chain, the old ball and chain, right? Oh, I got to go home. My wife has dragged me down. She keeps me home. That's an immature masculine view of femininity that resents the fact that femininity is drawing it down into the world. But when you appreciate what femininity is, then you're grateful for your anchor, for that which settles you down, for that which gives your soul some peace so you can focus on a mission here in this world. And if not for that, why did your soul even come into a body? If your soul's going to come into embodiment, okay, so then finish the job and do what you were sent here for. A man without a woman can't do that. And ultimately, when this happens on a, macro, on a macrocosmic level for the entire universe, like I mentioned earlier, we'll appreciate the holiness of the physical world. The souls in the highest heavens are going to come back down to their bodies. God will be apparent in the physical world even more than he is in the spiritual. You know, the problem today is that in Gullus, when we're in Gullus, and the Shechina is in Gullus, Shechinta Begulosa, so you can look at the physical world and not see God. When Mashiach comes and the world is healed, you're going to look at the physical world and you won't see anything but God. In fact, you'll see God more down here than you ever could in the highest heaven, which is precisely why the souls in the highest heavens will come down here, because whatever they were experiencing up there will pale in comparison to what is accessible in the physical world. Okay, so now you understand the, the basic characters here that we're dealing with. In Atzilus, you could call it Zo and Malchus. In Shemois, you can call it Kuchubrichu and Shchinte. In time, you can call it six workdays and Shabbos. In a home, you call it a husband and a wife. It's one concept.
These patterns repeat themselves like fractals in nature, like the shape of the tree is the shape of the leaf. Ever notice that? If you ever look at the contour of a tree, look at the silhouette of a tree. The shape of the tree is the shape of the leaf. The pine tree has little needle leaves. What does a pine tree look like? It looks like a needle. An oak tree has broad leaves. You look at an oak tree from the distance. Look at the contours, the silhouette of an oak tree. It's broad, it's wide, and it has little dips in it, just like the leaf. These are repeating patterns. This is a sacred geometry that's embedded in the fabric of the universe. And once you know how to identify these patterns, you'll see them everywhere. In fact, you'll even see it within yourself because there's masculine and feminine within each of us. And you'll identify your own masculinity and your own femininity and how they're in conflict with each other as well as how to harmonize the conflict. Let's talk about how they relate to each other, the masculine and the feminine. How are we doing? Good? Okay. Let's talk about how they relate to each other. If you don't understand the relationship between the masculine and the feminine, one of the first mistakes that you will make is that you will think that the feminine is passive and useless and completely dependent on the masculine if you don't understand what's really happening. When you understand the dynamics, then it flips and you come to see it completely different. I'll give you an example. <clears throat> like I mentioned before, in Atsilos, Malchus wants to create, but she doesn't have the building blocks to create with. So she has to get it from Zo. Zo is the six emotional energies, which are the building blocks of creation. So she needs him. She's dependent on him. She's looking up at him and saying, no, can we do this already? He's flying high. So she can't create without him. And if you just tell that half of the story, she looks very passive and very dependent. But what's the rest of the story? The other half of the story. The other half of the story is that he gives her what he's got and she creates something completely new out of it. She's not a receptacle, she's a recipient. Malchus is not a receptacle, Malchus is a recipient. A receptacle is something, you put something in it, and then you come back later, and all you've got there is whatever you put in it. This is a receptacle. A seven-ounce cup, doesn't matter if you fill it with coffee or orange juice or milk or vodka, you will never get more than seven ounces of liquid out of this cup because that's all that it contains and all you can take from it is what you put into it. That's a receptacle. Malchus is not a receptacle, Malchus is a recipient. You know what a recipient is? A recipient is one that you put something into, you come back later and you get back more than what you put into it. Like a true student is a recipient, not a receptacle. A student who can only parrot what the teacher said, that's a receptacle. That's like the seven ounce cup that you can never get anything more out of it than whatever you put into it. But a true student, a true student is somebody who can give back more than, the, more than they were taught. Like it says, I learned much from my teachers, more from my colleagues, but from my students most of all. How can the teacher learn from the students? The teacher's giving, the student's receiving. Yeah, because the student is a true recipient, and a true recipient means whatever I get, I develop and when I give it back to you, it's improved. And that's what femininity is. Femininity is not a passive receptacle where you just put stuff for safekeeping and come back and get it later. 
Femininity is a recipient where whatever she gets, she develops and she puts it back out in an upgraded form. And on every level, this is the male-female paradigm. Six days in Shabbos. Six days are masculine. Shabbos is feminine. Shabbos is the queen. So from one perspective, Shabbos is a loser because she can't make anything for herself. We say that if you toil on Erev Shabbos, you have what to eat on Shabbos. If you don't toil on Erev Shabbos, you have nothing to eat on Shabbos. What does that mean? Shabbos is a day where if you didn't cook and clean and prepare and shop and do all the things that you can do during the six days, you'll have nothing on the seventh day. That's half the story. What's the other half of the story? The other half of the story is what the six days give to Shabbos. They give her a kugel, and she turns that into warmth, love, a connected family, spirituality, transcendence. So yeah, the first half of the story is when she's waiting around for him to make a move because she does need to receive from him. But the other half of the story is what she does with what she receives. She upgrades it. That's what masculine and feminine are. The simplest illustration of it, and I think the most helpful one when we get confused about gender roles, is the biological model. Because that can't be disputed. When it comes to emotional stuff, psychological stuff, you could start arguing it's a social construct if you would raise them in a laboratory, then you could, uh, they would be free from these uh, traditional gender roles. So I like to look at the biological model because that is still un indisputable. They have not found a way around that. And that is that for the act of procreation, it is the feminine parent who receives something from the masculine parent and then a little while later gives back what she got but in upgraded form. In fact, infinitely upgraded because what she gives birth to is infinitely more valuable than the form in which she or originally received it. But that's what femininity is. When you place a seed in the ground so where does the tree come from? Is it the seed or is it the ground? I mean, it is the seed. Without the seed, nothing grows. And it's clearly the seed, because if you put an apple seed in the ground, you get apple trees. You put an orange seed in the ground, you get orange trees. And what's the ground? The ground's just a place to put the seed. Yeah. But if you don't have the ground, then all the potential of the seed will never come out. And there's infinite potential in that seed. And it'll never come out. It'll just be one seed. But when you put it in the ground, infinite potential comes out. And when I say infinite, what do I mean infinite? Literally uncountable. I don't mean all at once in one crop in one year. But I mean the potential that's in the one seed. They say anyone can count the seeds in an apple, but only God can count the apples in a seed. Because potentially there are infinite apples in every seed. They can just keep regenerating generation after generation. But that will only happen when the seed is placed in the ground. More than the rich man does for the pauper, the pauper does for the rich man. Literally and figuratively. Literally. The recipient gives more to the giver than the giver gives to the recipient. But also figuratively, that any time you have the giver, which is the masculine entity, uniting with the recipient, which is the feminine entity, the giver ends up receiving more than the recipient received from him.
Now, you want an insight into men? I'll give you an insight into men. We have this concept called mashpia and makabal. Giver and recipient. So what is a man? A man is a mashpia, a giver. And that's all well and good. It sounds great until you actually look at the whole story and you realize, hold on a second. His greatness is that he's a giver. But as soon as he gives it to her, she starts immediately developing it. She starts working on it. And whether we're talking about biological reproduction or whether we're talking about a vision, an idea, a concept, she's always developing. By the way, in, I kept talking about Zohan Malchus. That's on the emotional plane. There's an even higher plane. There's Chochmah and Bina, same relationship. Chochmah is the little germ of an idea, a little kernel of thought. In Chochmah, you'll never practically apply anything because it's just it's too abstract. So Chochmah is the, is the father, is Abba. Bina is Ima, the mother. Chochmah impregnates Bina. What does Bina do? She's elaborative thought, expansive thought. Bina Malashin Boina, to build. She takes his crazy abstract idea and fleshes it out. Just like she does with the baby in her womb, she does with ideas. He says it as an abstract idea. She turns it into something real, something practical. Oh, he had a cool idea of where to go on vacation. He never thought about the, pack, the fact you got to pack clothing for the kids. And what are you going to do during the four-hour layover at the airport? Who's going who's to bring sandwiches? He didn't think of that. She thinks of that. So she's always developing it and making it real. She brings out the details, the practicality. And then she gives it back to him. She gives it back to him. So who's the giver? Now do you understand the plight of masculinity? My whole role is that I'm a giver. But the reality is my wife will always give me more than anything I could ever give to her. So then who am I? What am I? What am I worth? Hmm? Hmm. The seed. So how do you embrace being a seed? How, how, how is a man supposed to be comfortable with the idea that he's a seed? Right. So she needs him. Yeah, that's true. But what she does is so much more impressive. And you have to understand why that's threatening. And if you're all going to rush to minimize how painful this is for a man, you're going to miss the opportunity to truly have empathy. Please understand how scary this is that a man knows deep down his entire role and identity is that he's a provider and yet anything he could provide to her will always pale in comparison to what she ends up giving back. If you don't understand why that is existentially terrifying for a man, I want you to take a second to connect with your empathy. And maybe you will understand and start to identify certain unnerving, perplexing behaviors of your husband that may, make, that may make sense to you now in this light. Yeah, I talk to men too. I do. Yeah. But this is a woman's crowd. In the men's crowds, I try to get them to be compassionate on their wives. In a woman's crowd, I try to get women to be compassionate on their husbands. <laughs> okay, so. Yeah. 
but this is, this is how it was given to me, so this is how I'm going to give it to you. And you'll do with it whatever you need to do with it. I trust you, because you're women. And you'll figure out, you'll figure out what it needs to look like in real life. I'm just a speaker. I don't solve problems. I just get people to think in a new way, and then hopefully they apply it in real life. That's all I'm doing. The sages ask a question, who's a bigger baltzdaka, a husband or a wife? And they're speaking about in a home where there are tra traditional gender roles, where the husband goes out and works and brings home the flour, the wheat, and the wife takes the flour and she bakes the bread. So our sages say, when a pauper comes to the door and asks for food, can he eat wheat? The pauper can't eat wheat. He needs bread. The husband brought home a bag of wheat. That's how they used to get paid in the olden days. But nobody benefits from what the husband brought home. It only becomes useful when the wife takes the bag of wheat the husband brought to her and makes bread out of it. People eat bread. That's useful. You understand what I'm saying? Masculinity is to realize that you're a provider, and yet what you're providing is really useless, and you feel that you're not needed. Please understand the deep dread that every man has that he is absolutely useless. And he does not have the emotional support that you do. Because men don't talk to each other. Men swallow it until they die of a heart attack or they kill themselves. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. Let's sit in the uncomfortability of it. That the biggest cause of death of middle-aged men is suicide. A man is terribly afraid of the fact that his life has no meaning. He's nothing but a money machine. When he's bad at that, he hates himself. When he's good at it, he feels like he's being used. Men don't rely on each other. They don't speak to each other about this. They don't have support. We're terrified of being vulnerable. So we're alone. We hate ourselves and we feel useless. And our greatest fear is that our wives will figure that out. So you're a mashpia, you're a giver. Great. She's a bigger giver. She'll always be a bigger giver. Anything you'll ever provide, she'll always improve it. Chochma will give to Bina, she'll improve it. Zo will give to Malchus, she'll improve it. A father will impregnate a mother, she'll improve that. It's always, she's always outdoing him. Yeah. Share with me how it comes up in your life. What's the last silly, impractical, clueless thing that your husband expected of you because he has no clue what it takes to actually do things in real life? And he thought he was being sweet and spontaneous. And you were totally stressed out by it because it's totally not realistic and not practical. That only happens a few times before he's too embarrassed to offer himself again, and he goes to his man cave to sulk. These are paradigms. This is the fabric of the universe. It's unavoidable. If you don't recognize these patterns, sit with it a while. These things come up. These patterns come up in every single place. Right. 
Correct. When, when single women live together, they make it like a nice little home. They actually like, they have hand towels. <laughs> a bachelor pad, they don't have sheets on the mattresses. You don't want to know how your husband lived before he met you. The laundry hamper is a pile in the middle of the living room for single men. Yeah, if they don't stop living like Bahram, yeah, then they continue to do that. Yeah, and that causes conflict. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so what's our role? Very good, that's a great question. But what I want to explain to you is not what's your role. I want to explain to you his role so you can help cheer him on. You got it. But you know, the, you said you compliment the seed. But you know the greatest compliment? Just receive it. Receive it. Yeah, but appreciation is, you could say to someone, wow, this dinner you made looks scrumptious. Have some. Mm, I'm not hungry. Doesn't work that way. So here's the deal. When he gives, you receive. Women don't realize the ways in which they shut down their husbands. And you don't realize, right or wrong, how fragile the male ego is and how low of a threshold he has to the embarrassment and the shame of failing an attempt to provide something to you that you would value. He feels so ashamed that what he offered you wasn't received that he'll just give up and he becomes withdrawn and silent. So the art of being married to a man is the art of encouraging his giving. Now that's a really difficult art. And I'll tell you one thing that makes it super complicated, and that is, you, you know as well as I do, that you can't receive everything. And I don't just mean you can't receive everything from everybody, I mean you can't receive everything from anybody. Because sometimes even the people that you're closest to are trying to put something on you or in you that's not healthy. And you can't be present to receive it. It's not safe. It's not self-respectful self to receive it. You have to have boundaries and standards. That's what makes it so difficult to be a macabre is that you have to be so careful. If he's trying, if he's sharing with you or expanding into you in a way that's invasive or disrespectful, you can't be present to receive that. That's not going to help the relationship. Sometimes women appease men in those ways because they feel like it'll just be more peaceful if they give in and okay fine but that doesn't actually lead to greater bonding so you can't accept everything I mean let's give a really easy example that's cut and dried and it's a no-brainer if what he's trying to give you is abusive then no you can't be present there to receive it okay that's an obvious example most things are not as obvious as something that's outright abusive but there are things that on a on a subtle level, are disrespectful. And if you're there to receive it, it doesn't lead to greater bonding. It, sometimes it diffuses the tension for the moment, but it doesn't lead to more trust, more connectedness.
So you can't receive everything. You have to have a filter. And yet, at the same time, if you make the mistake of putting up a wall and saying, I'm not here to receive any more at all because it's unsafe, well, what's going to happen? And a lot of times, women put up a protective wall. By the way, many times women put up, women put up a protective wall, and it's not so much a response to their marriage, but to earlier experiences. I think we have to be transparent about the fact that a third of women, even in a religious community, have experienced some type of sexual assault or violation. It's horrific, but it's true. And if that's happened to you, don't think that your survival mechanisms haven't put up a wall. Of course they have. You'd be insane not to. But then what do you do when you have that wall and you bring it into your marriage and the entire relationship is about him being able to provide for you but you're, you can't be receptive because you don't feel safe. You know how many times people come to me with marriage problems and they, they love to get hyper-focused on, on the most distracting, superficial, external manifestations of, of the relationship. And they actually think that's the problem. We're fighting about such and such, and if we'll just get somebody to come in and referee this fight, then there will be peace. And, and it's never that simple. If it were that simple, they would have figured it out on their own. When you have a husband and a wife who are really butting heads, they're really at an impasse, it's always about deeper stuff. It's always about deeper stuff. And usually, it's about, on the woman's side, and I'm just speaking about the women now, because this is a predominantly female audience, usually it's some inability to receive. And the inability to receive makes perfect sense, by the way. I'm not bashing it at all. Because if you had trauma for sure, then what do you want? You're, you're, you're just trying to survive. So that, that's going to make it difficult to receive. If in your relationship presently with your spouse, he ever overstepped a boundary, even mistakenly because he was just a dumb bacher and didn't know how to treat a woman because they don't teach them that. He didn't know what he was doing was invasive and disrespectful. He didn't know. He didn't know he was objectifying you, using you, insulting you. He didn't know. He's a good man. He didn't know. But what do you want? You felt disrespected. You felt invaded. You felt encroached upon. And your God-given survival mechanisms put up a wall to protect you. Okay, I can't blame a woman for protecting herself. It makes perfect sense. The question is, what do we do now? He's shut down because he feels like a loser because he can't give anything to her that she'll receive and internalize. Meanwhile, that only feeds into her perception that he's unreliable. So she's given up on him too. He's not there for me. That's what she's saying. He's not there for me. He's unreliable. Well, He's not there for you because he's, he's pouting. Yeah, it's boyish, it's childish, it's immature. I'm not trying to, I'm, I'm not taking the men's side. I'm also not taking the women's side. To me, the whole thing's heartbreaking. Everyone is just doing their best and reacting to the trauma that they went through. And, and I can't blame either side. It makes, everyone's reaction makes perfect sense to me. So he's pouting in his cave because he's embarrassed because he doesn't want to put himself out there anymore. She's frustrated because she's Malchus and she's waiting for, for a mashpia to show up in her life. And she's frustrated and lonely and understimulated and bored. And they're living in the same house, not knowing what to do. Trust me when I tell you, these patterns are universal. They exist in Atsilos, they exist in the physical world, they exist on every plane and in every dimension. Not to the same extent, by the way. 
Some marriages have a heavy case of this. Some marriages have a lighter case of this. Maybe in previous reincarnations, you cleaned up most of it. Not everyone's going to experience this to the same degree. But to some degree, this is what happens in the universe. Is that masculinity stops showing up for femininity. And then once that happens, nothing, nothing can proceed. We're at a complete standstill. So here's what I, I want to advise you practically. But even when I say practical, I don't even really mean practical. I mean a man's version of practical. You'll make it practical. When you give chazara of what I taught today, please add the actual practical applications. I can't do it. You could do it. If you're at an impasse, try to locate, to identify ways in which your husband is giving to you. And when I say giving, I mean initiating. Because Mashpia and Makabal, he's a giver, but she's a bigger giver. So then what's he? The only thing that's special about him is that he gives first. Mashpia and Makabal is not giver and recipient, because a recipient's a bigger giver than a giver. So if you say Mashpia and Makabal is giver and recipient, it's not really true. She's a bigger giver than he is. But what is he? He gives first. Try to locate and identify situations in which, in which your husband is initiating. Initiating could be something like he comes home and, again, maybe he's clueless and you're trying to get supper ready and you've got kids running naked and soapy, slipping on the bathroom floor, and you got a baby crying, and you got a toddler about to fall down the stairs, and the schnitzel's about to burn in the frying pan, and he comes in and stands next to you and says, you want to hear a vort? <laughs> and it's like, oh my God, will you get a clue what I'm dealing with over here? Okay, yeah, you're right, he's clueless. I know that. But stop a second, ask yourself, is it abusive? Is it invasive? Is he, is he doing something inappropriate? Or is he just trying to give you something? If it's inappropriate, meaning it's unsafe, I don't want any woman for the sake of peace to do anything that makes her feel disrespected or unsafe. And I want to repeat that again. I don't want any woman for the sake of peace to do anything that would ever make her feel disrespected or unsafe. Ever, because it won't lead to peace anyway. But if he's just clumsy, he's trying to feel it out, he's trying to get his juices flowing, he's trying to give you something. So if you can, try to just be a recipient. Try to feel the energy moving from him to you. Because that's what you want anyways, right? That's your complaint. Your complaint is, he's not giving. He's not providing. He's not present for me. Yeah, I know. He's on his phone because he doesn't get embarrassed. He doesn't fail interacting with his phone. He gets embarrassed because he fails trying to interact with you. So what I'm saying is, give him a win. Let him experience successful initiation of an emotional exchange. By the way, just so you know that I pick on the men just as much as I'm picking on you, you know what I tell the men? I say, when you come through the door and you're feeling beaten down by the world and you go to your wife to give you nurturing and, and, and a sense of well-being, when you turn her into mommy, you're killing the relationship. I tell the men, because you're the giver. And if you walk through the door and you're taking from her, you just flipped the whole masculine-feminine paradigm and it won't work. I tell men all the time, if you come through the door and you're emotionally needy and you're trying to take from your wife, I promise you it's not going to lead to other ways where you want to be masculine and a provider and give to her. She won't be able to receive from you because you already turned her 
into uh, this, this mugging victim. You emotionally mugged her when you walked through the door. I tell the men that. When you come through the door, come through the door as a giver. So I, I think I'm fair when I, when I give advice. I think I'm, I'm equal. But as far as the advice to the women, you know how nursing works? As long as your baby is nursing, you're going to make more milk. That's how Hashem made it. As long as the recipient is receiving, the provider will provide. And when the recipient's not, not receiving anymore, the provider stops providing. As long as the students are engaged, the teacher will teach. And when the students are no longer engaged, the teacher dries up. He has nothing to say. So you want more? You deserve more. You deserve your husband to show up for you in every way. Mentally, emotionally, physically, socially, yes. And that's what Hashem wants. Hashem wants healthy homes where husbands and wives are bonded to each other on every one of these levels, of course. So you deserve your husband to show up for you in all these ways to be a provider for you in all these ways, to give you time, to give you focus, to give you attention, to give you compliments, to give you love, to give you affection, to give you, his, 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 just to give you his commitment that he's here for you. He's here for you. Yes, you deserve him to give to you in all of these ways. What I'm telling you is please recognize the subtle ways in which he's attempting to give and he's failing. And be more surgical be more strategic in finding tiny little opportunities to grant him success in providing something for you. So, if at all possible, when the kids are running around slipping on the bathroom tile and the baby is crying and the schnitzel is about to burn and he comes to the door and he says, you want to hear a vort? If at all possible, If you can just let him say it and thank him for it, give him a win and say to him, that's so cool. Can we talk about that more at dinner? And I want to tell you the miracle that will happen. That night he'll actually come to dinner because he wants to give you much more than he wants to be on his stupid phone. But if he doesn't think showing up to the dinner table is an opportunity to be a mashpia and to give you anything that you're receiving, yeah, so he's on his stupid phone. Because that's safer. Yeah. Emotionally needy when he comes to the door, emotionally needy. Yeah. But in that case, he's trying to give. But he's trying to give. Yeah, you're right. It's a clumsy attempt to give. But there's a learning curve. Here's. Okay. Here's what I'm, one second. Every skill requires practice. Men need practice giving. The more they give, the better they get at it. But when they fail, they stop practicing and they don't get better. Again, if you feel unsafe, then that's a different situation. Yeah, well, there are levels, I guess, of respect. Yeah.
In his mind, yeah. In, no, well, here's the thing. You're saying he's earning a living. Is it providing? In his mind, it is. But very often to his wife, it's not. She doesn't feel like he's doing that with her. In his mind, it totally is. Like, why am I dealing with this craziness if not to provide for my wife? So in his language, he's providing. In her language, he hasn't even begun providing. In fact, he's out somewhere else with other people. Let's say she is on the page. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's exactly what happens. That's right. He says, I was out there providing all day. When am I going to get to get? And so he comes through the door and he starts taking from his wife. And that's why I always tell the men, a man cannot healthily receive anything from his wife that isn't her returning something to him in an upgraded fashion that he originally gave to her. But let me explain what that means. Just like conception. What he gives to her, Chazal call it a tipa srucha. It's not a compliment. It's a denigrating term. What she gives to him is his child. A person with an ashama. So he gets back from her something that he gave to her, but it's an infinitely upgraded form. What I try to explain to the husbands is, you will never be satisfied taking anything from your wife, whether it's attention, validation, affection, time, whatever, because you're not, men are not meant to be takers, they're meant to be givers, Oh, so then when do I get, the men ask. And I say to them, when do you get? When you impregnate her emotionally or physically or on any other level. And she gives you back the baby that she developed. So I tell men, come through the door, invest in her. Give her time, focus, energy. You're going to get it all back multiple times over. Because that's just what she does. That's what Malchus does. You put one seed in the dirt, an infinite amount of apples will grow for the end, till the end of time. So the men have to know, initiate, give to your wife even a little bit, you'll get back infinitely from her. But it'll only hit the spot and be satisfying when, for a man, he's receiving back the energy that he invested in his wife. But if he comes through the door, he doesn't put anything into her. He's not investing energy into her. He just walks through the door and starts taking energy from her. Then everything falls apart. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's why it's a vicious cycle. He says, I was out all day. I was giving all day. I was giving all day. So what I tell men is, not that you guys really should hear this, but I tell them, you are giving all day, and you're going to come home and spoil it in two minutes. If you are giving all day, just give for two more minutes. Enter the door as a giver. Give her attention. Give her focus. It won't take more than two minutes. See, the men get... Intimidated, They think, I was giving all day. Now I'm going to come home. I'm going to have to give to her for the rest of the day. No, you don't. The men just have to... They, well, that's what they think, and that's why they're afraid to do it, and they give up, and they don't try. But I always tell the men, give to her for two minutes. It'll fill her up. And when she's filled up, she'll fill your whole home with light. The man doesn't have to fill the home with light. He can't fill the home with light. He has to fill his wife for two minutes with a little bit of time and attention. She becomes impregnated with that energy, and she fills the entire home with warmth and with light. That's just how it works. There's no other way for it to work. Yeah.
Yeah. He'll gain much more. Correct. Yeah. And she'll be happier. Right. Right. So, uh, look, I don't want to make this the women's problem. But what I would say is, let's say he enters the house and he's in taking mode. Yeah, he's tired. He's not in giving mode. So what you can do is, you can ride it out, you wait for him to be rested. Sometimes he just needs to decompress. And then when he starts giving... Like when he starts to tell you about his day. Oh, now he's giving. So that's my opportunity as a woman to receive that. And then once he starts flowing, that's how a giver gives. It's just once you start flowing, everything goes. Everything goes. When, when, when you're a giver, it's all about flow. Anything that interrupts the flow, then it's a forget it. And it's, it's very shameful, by the way, as a giver. There's nothing more embarrassing than speaking to a room full of people who are talking. It's the most shameful thing. Hmm? Can she ask? The art of femininity is to bring it out of him without explicitly ordering it. First of all, when you do explicitly order it, it ends up not satisfying you. Right When you have to coach him and tell him how to give to you, then it feels like, well, I might as well just do this myself. And you know why it feels that way? Because you are taking the initiative and you are doing it yourself when you tell him to give. It says that a woman is not supposed to explicitly demand intimacy from her husband. That doesn't just mean that one thing. It means all types of emotional bonding. So what's she supposed to do? Sit there and just wait? No, she's supposed to use her femininity to start to awaken his desire to give and to provide. Like, very simple. Let's use a very not emotionally charged example. Again, the teacher and the students. The students are sitting quietly, ready. We're here to absorb. The teacher is not going to be able to help himself from speaking. But if the students are all chatting and talking and they're looking at their phones, and the then the teacher's like, what am I, you know, I have self-respect. I'm not going to be an idiot. I'm not going to talk. No one wants to hear me talk. So there are cues, there are hints that a recipient can give that make a giver feel like this is going to be good. And the art of femininity, of receptivity, is giving those cues so that the giver wants to give. Hmm? Don't degrade yourself to ask. It won't satisfy you anyway. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah, it, it can work if you don't. No, you can't make them listen to it. Right. But you, you don't need both sides to be in on this. If you do what you got to do, it'll help even if they're clueless. The truth is, we all know that if you, if you have to have one, if you have a marriage and one partner is clueless and the other one is working, you tell me, this is such a sexist thing to say, but it's just true. If you have a marriage and you have one partner who's clueless and the other partner who's working, meaning really working on the relationship, and it's either going to be the husband or the wife, which scenario creates a healthier, happier home? Yeah, when the wife is the one who's doing the work. It's terrible, and I'm not saying it to put that on you. It's just a fact of life. That's what a keres bias means. The foundation of the home means that when she is working at the marriage and the relationship, it's a lot more effective than when he's working at it. It doesn't absolve him, and I don't want you to think I'm saying that.
That's a great attitude. I like that. Okay, you, should I do these questions and then we'll wrap up? Okay. What if, no, what's if that is exactly my struggle? Letting go of the tzelim. I know my tzlamim are, I know what they are, and it is hard for me to let go. I feel stuck, frozen. The unknown and letting go of that identity feels scary. I would love clarity. Well, you know, that's always the allure of a Vedazora, like I said before, and I'll say again. Why do we turn to false gods? What do they promise us? Is a false sense of security. And we feel like if we give up the idols, we'll be unsafe, we'll die. And we have to realize what a sheker, what a lie that is. These false gods, whatever they are, and like I said, they're all the character defects that we rely on to make us have that illusion, that false sense that we'll be okay. If I can be the biggest, toughest, meanest person in the room, then I'll be safe. Or if I can get everyone in the room to like me, then I'll be safe. If I can be the smartest guy in the room, then I'll be safe. If I'll have the most money, then I'll be safe. These are the tzlamim. These are the idols. And we have to realize none of those things can take care of you. And only Hashem is taking care of you. And when you really put yourself completely in Hashem's hands, it's terrifying at first. But after you do it, it's so natural because the idolatry was never authentic it was never natural to you it was never organic it was always superimposed you're carrying it so long it feels like it's part of you but it's not you people will say that well I just have this issue I'm just angry I'm just fearful I'm just whatever no you're not you're not you are pure and holy, and happy, and fearless, and joyful, and all this stuff, it's not you. And it feels like you'll die the minute you let go of it. So let go of it and see that you didn't die. And that, to the contrary, you begin to live, to really live. How much of Judaism today is broken telephone? And when we find ourselves doing something because that's just what's expected, but not necessarily a Torah value, do we continue doing those things? Example, Tznia standards dictated by our community. Yeah. This is a tough one because how do we differentiate between what is authentic and what is inauthentic. You know, the adaptations to Gullus, the defense mechanisms to Gullus, can happen on systemic levels, meaning it's not just homes that are affected by these maladaptations. It could be an entire community. And I understand where it comes from. I understand the threat and why the response, the survival impulse kicks in. But yeah, it's true. I don't know if this is going to help. I don't know if I'm going to make you more confused than you were before you asked the question. But I think what's happening in this generation I said it before on a micro level about individuals and families. And I also mentioned it on the macro, macro level of like the whole universe. I said we're all cleansing, and we're returning to our, authentic, our, our authentic selves. I kind of skipped the middle tier, which is communities. It's happening on a community level as well. It can't not happen. It already started and there's no way to stop it. And there are people with a vested interest in stopping it. But they can't stop it anymore. 
and it's going to be fine. Yiddishkeit is not going to fall apart, has for Sholem. Mashiach is coming. Yiddishkeit's only going to get stronger and stronger. And more and more authentic. So I don't want to be the one. You're the women. You'll figure out practically what this should look like. But I'll just say on a very conceptual level, any of the artificial overlays that are being imposed and that are not authentically Torah will be identified and it won't even require a struggle to get rid of them. They will all be gently laid aside and will just be left with authentic Jewish spirituality. And I'm, frankly, I'm very excited to be around to see it happen. People are healing. Every family is healing. If you're not the one in your family that's healing, then someone else in your family is healing, it's probably the person you think is the most sick. <laughs> or if you're the one in your family healing, then you're the one they think is the most sick. <laughs> but the families are healing. Communities are healing. Yiddishkeit's getting stronger. The Abishter is becoming more revealed in the world. Not the opposite. Don't, don't buy into the, the hype. Don't buy the fear. Mashiach is coming. Things are getting better, not worse. Manhattan? What's wrong with Manhattan? Hmm? We're in Gullis, you know. We're in Gullis. I don't expect that Manhattan is like Yudushalayim, but you know what? In Gullis, Yudushalayim is not like Yudushalayim. Things are getting better. Of course they are. Everything's getting better. Everything's healing. And while we're healing, yeah, we're purging some stuff. We are. We're purging stuff. And crazy stuff's coming. And you're vomiting a Salem and a Hitler and a Stalin and all this garbage is coming up. But it, we're getting rid of it. We're not keeping it. We're not holding it. We're purging it. About generational triggers, another thing came in. Of course, various energy techniques can release them, question mark. I like how it says of course, but it ends with a question mark. <laughs> what? Oh, it wasn't. But breathing? Do you know real examples of people who release those triggers with just breathing? Yeah, myself. I don't talk about anything that I don't do. See, what you have to understand is everything I talk about is experiential. I don't waste anyone's time telling them what I read in a book. Yeah, I got my ideas from books, but I don't bore you to tell you it when I only got it from a book. What happens is, here's the process. I learn it in a book. Then I spend time internalizing it. Sometimes it takes years. And when I'm finally putting it into practice, then I talk about it publicly. If I haven't personally put it into practice yet, I won't talk about it publicly. Why would I do that? So yeah, I, I'm, I'm healing. And yes, breathing has been very helpful to me. And no, I never took a breath workshop, and maybe I will someday. I haven't. I don't know any techniques for it. I, I don't know how to do it, but I've been doing it my whole life. I've been breathing since I was alive. And, you know, it seems like something I've got to continue doing as long as I'm alive. So why not just do it more mindfully, more deliberately? You know, I'll tell you also. I don't know if I'm breathing right or not. Like I said, I never, no one ever taught me how to do this. I've been doing it since I was born. But I'll tell you one of the things it does for me. For me, for me. I'm, I'm, maybe this won't resonate with you. Where there is breath, there is life. And where there is life, there is hope. Wish I didn't even have to finish that sentence, but I will. Every breath is hope. When we feel like we can't keep going, take another real breath. 
And somehow, at least you'll have enough hope to make it till the next breath. Okay, last question. If my children are exposed to dysfunction and unhealthy behaviors from extended family members, and they hear questions and get confused, how do I as a parent respond to them? These family members are hurtful to my husband and myself. Okay. Well, there's a couple things here. First of all, I'm assuming the person who wrote this question already knows this, but I'll just say it. You don't have to expose yourself to everything. Like I said with women, you don't have to accept everything your husband is offering if you don't feel it's safe. Well, there is such a thing as boundaries and making choices about what types of situations I put myself. And sometimes you just have to have more self-respect and be more firm about that. That's part, but that's only part of it. The other part of it is, okay, so now let's say you're doing your best to protect yourself and your children. But there's still some stuff that gets past the filter. And your children are exposed to it. Okay. So if you're really doing your best to not, to not allow that stuff in, but it's still getting through. I think it's an opportunity. Your children are going to find out sooner or later that not everybody is healthy. Or to put it in a different, more positive way, that each of us are at different stages of healing. And sometimes people who we're, we're related to, in fact, Sometimes people we love are not very far along in their process of healing and they're still doing things that are sick. I think it's helpful for children to understand that these are not bad people. These are people who are unwell. And that we have to have compassion. At the same time, having compassion doesn't mean to lack compassion on myself and to disrespect myself by accepting every toxic thing that somebody wants to put on me. I can be compassionate and I can also have self-respect. I can understand that people are imperfect and they do things that are hurtful. That's what you wrote in the question. That these relatives are acting in a way that's hurtful. Okay. Where should your children learn how to deal with that other than from you? Hashem is creating the situation. Hashem engineered the situation. Hashem knows what he's doing. So this is your opportunity to model for your children how to deal with hurtful people. And every situation is your opportunity to model for your children how to deal with a world that's still imperfect. We're closer to perfection than ever, but there are still vestiges of, of sickness, and sometimes it comes out in ways that are hurtful. But we need to know how to deal with it. One of the ways is not to be panicked. Again, we, are, we were in Gullis for so long that we get triggered so deeply by any threat, any amount of toxicity makes us feel like there's this massive monster consuming us. And it's not true. The clip of today, it's, don't feed it. We're the only ones who give it strength. Like the woman who can't get rid of the tzela because in her mind she made it such a big thing. But that's how it always is. We make it into such a big thing. It's not a big thing. The people who are hurting you are just unwell people. They're just not well. Okay, so daven for them. Say a kapitel tillum for them. If you can help them, help them. If you can't, sometimes you can't help them. Okay, you say tillum for them. That's it. 
we don't have to make it this dark, looming monster. You know, elephants in the circus, how do they keep them tied down? They chain their foot to a spike in the ground. But the reality is that any elephant can just pull that spike right out of the ground with just one lifting their foot. So then why don't the elephants all run away from the circus? And the answer is that they catch the elephants when they're babies and they chain them up when they're babies. <clears throat> and when they're babies, they're not strong enough to rip that chain out of the ground. And after a few thousand times trying to do it, they give up. And they come to a state known as learned helplessness. Well, I want to ask you a question. You don't think all the mitzvahs that were done for thousands of years refined this world and made it a more delicate, more refined place? You don't think all the mesidus nefesh and the martyrdom and the Jewish blood that soaked the soil had a refining effect on the world? You don't think everything that our ancestors did for millennia had any effect? Of course it did. So today, the klippa is so flimsy, but our minds give it power. So we think we're chained down, and so we don't even attempt to lift our foot, because we still think we can't. But the, real, the reality is we can. At this point, any individual who chooses can be liberated and can, can experience a gula protis. A gula protis means that psychologically you can already be living in the times of Mashiach. Psychologically. I'm not pretending that the world is all ready for that. Until the entire world is liberated and redeemed, okay, we're still in Gullis and we're still going to have to fast on Tisha B'Av, but it could happen in the next two days that the entire world could become liberated. And Mashiach will be here and we won't fast on Tisha B'Av. And if it doesn't happen on a universal scale, then at least let it happen for you. Everything that's terrifying you, internally and externally, all these monsters are nothing. There's nothing stopping us today from being healthy. There's nothing stopping us today from being loving and serene and at peace and kind and generous and, and, and fearless. There's nothing stopping us except for our own internalized gullus trauma. And if I could share any message with you today, it is that I want you to keep your eyes open and watch people waking up. It's happening already. One by one, people are waking up. And you can choose to be terrified by it or you can celebrate it. I'm celebrating it because I know who wins in the end. I know the end of this story. Mashiach comes. I know the end of this story. God is revealed in the world. I know how this story ends. It's a glorious ending. And each family that wakes up and each individual that wakes up is getting us closer to that. All right. Well, uh, yeah, okay. <laughs>